Welcome back, fellow armchair generals, and hello, Lalas. You still watching this in the mornings? I'm not sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Gamer1745 with my continuing look or early look at TRE, Third Reich Events, I should just maybe say, and the current version of Black Eyes. Now, I'm seeing we don't have very many free spies, so let's look over here. Um, and we don't need officers really right now, so what we're going to do is we want to continue to build some, but let's let's do that. And so we're going to play and make an episode or two of this right now. I know a lot of you are watching the other playthrough that with ten point four one. But I do want to, need to, take a look and see how this is all going along. And we have Fleet Auxiliary Carrier Doctrine. Very nice. That is nice, but the big thing is that it will um, unlock the naval underway replenishment, particularly here, which we want for its extended operations. Okay, um, we like energy. You want energy, you can have energy. Um, you want metal, you can have metal. Turkey, what does Turkey want? Will you give them metal? Certainly, you can have metal. Now, all of you know, I think I'm trying to build a... historically based mod something based in realism when i sort of saved a little bit of this talk for when i got over to this then playing this other one um one of the viewers posted a sort of a set of questions one was um what divisions do I need to make to make the game historical, you know, historically correct? And I said, look up an order of battle um, of Germany. And, you know, um, look that up. Now, I go with, and I had help with this on some of the events, to some ways on dealing with that, that I don't know if it's historical or not. And he was partially wonder, wondering um, what divisions to build other than the ones given via events. These are only a sampling of stuff. Now, where the AI in Hearts of Iron 3 or 4 falls down it badly is the idea of a strategic reserve. It will put all divisions up at the front. That is not how any of this ever worked for any nations. Um, if, and, well, I'll get to that in a moment. So they don't do strategic, even for some place like Germany. They put, all the divisions will go to the borders based upon threat assessments by the AI. And humans often play that way. Um, if you'll notice most of my playthroughs, I leave these guys mostly alone. Ah, oh, I may sneak them across a you know little you know little bit of borders, and they did do some of that, but they didn't do much. I don't send my SA occupying the east front. These are very weak units, as we can see here. They will get and they will get slaughtered on the east front. If you you know on the front. But they could be. So you, you can abuse this system. And this is partly what there is the Warecrest system that a Revolver Held has added, which is the sort of training um, commands, training depots that um, he's represented on the map with their sort of equivalent of artillery and whatnot that existed. And that's part of what's going on. But they also had the Erzatz army. Or the home army in Germany. And that is what um, Stauffenberg and the, um, you know, the, the revolt and the assassination attempt on Hitler tries to mobilize to arrest 
the National Socialist Organizations like the SS, the SA um, in Germany. And that's a significant organization. I put a few of those units in events. Um, and some of them get upgrades during um, the war. One of them is a mountain division that was at the time um, somewhere here in Austria, at the time of the Yugoslav invasion, and it did participate in an offensive matter, ma manner for the Yugoslav campaign because it sort of wasn't a well-planned campaign. It was more like, oh shit, we have to add Yugoslavia to our invasion of Greece too. So it was, I don't know if mobilized is the right term, but it was, you know, utilized in the attack. And then basically, my understanding, it goes back to being a home army division, guarding the homeland, but also training up. I think, I do think they weren't specifically training centers like the Warecrest, but they were, um, manpower was being drawn out of them, as well as manpower sort of giving rest for, you know, soldiers back into it. Um, so there was some shifting of manpower in and out of this. Now, as Germany is collapsing, and oh, and there's panzer divisions um, that are part of this home army. Now, as Germany and the fronts are collapsing, more and more of these divisions were sent out to the front. And obviously, by the time you're getting into Germany and the Volkstrom is being raised, basically all of these home army divisions, one way or another, are now, you know, because we're now defending German borders, are mobilized. But do you include those? Those generally aren't included in most of the other nations. So again, it, and I only do a sampling of them um, with TRE. Now, I don't make TRE to make it the game easier, try to make it more historical. So what should be Germany's order of battle? Now you can look at the order of battle of the different campaigns. You know, Poland, the West, um, here, Falgelb and try to mimic that, that's fine. But part of what you're doing with this game, and not war in the East or war in the West, Gary Grigsby's type thing that just looks at the front, is you're, you're supposed to be making these decisions and maybe going, oh, well, hey, we could use an extra three divisions over here for Poland and prepare for it better. Or, hey, we, we don't need quite so many um, standing off against the Soviets. We want a, a few extra for France or whatever. And you're supposed to be doing this. This game is not designed to replicate a specific campaign or the specific war. It is there. So you can look that up. There is difficulty issues, but you can look at the order of battles. That wasn't his first question. His first question is, how many ICs do I need to build to be absolutely historical? God, I don't know. The upgrade grip lets you have more outgoing strategic resource trades. Yes, um, I understand. We'll get to some of that in a minute. I don't know how many. I'm sure hearts... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think I can say. I know Hearts of Iron design team at some point plays, uh, turns the game on and watches the AI play. And they try to have an orders of battle roughly that as their understanding to some historically based orders of battle. And do you have enough ICs to more or less um, build historical, you know, Thanks. Uh, you know, submarines, aircraft, ships, tanks, whatever, you know, tank unit, whether it's in Hearts of Iron 4 or Hearts of Iron 3, however it's modeled differently. But, and they play these out. And they try to figure out, well, you need X number of panzer divisions, X number of infantry, a, a Y number of, of submarines, you know, and then try to, okay, well, what are the um, ICs to make that? You know, that's just, you know, sort of, you know, backwards looking attempt at trying to do this. Because I know for a fact 
that production, particularly pre-war and early war, was, oh, hey, yeah, build us 80 of these Panzer III's model, you know, Panzer III C's or something like that, or 150 or whatever. Oh, yeah, do it in, in three months. Yeah, do it in three months. Yeah, fine. And so they build them, you know, you know whoever is, you know, um, Alket or whoever is, you know, building the, these Panzer III's. And... Now, Alket might have been able to, Oh, you want 903 months? No problem. They just get an order for a particular amount because Germany is not wanting to commit to too many of a particular model of tank, particularly in the early years. I believe it's the same situation for aircraft, for submarines. They want to build a production run and test them out and drive them. As the war is getting going in the early stages, you know, 1940, all the, all the way through the end of 1940 into 1941 they're especially after the victory in france they're going like hey you know um we don't want too many more panzer threes because yeah we're gonna we're gonna design better tanks for the next war this war is almost over you know they don't quite idle the production lines of some of these you know, still like, you know, they're fighting the Battle of Britain, so they're still worrying about, like, fighter aircraft. But they're actually sort of like, yeah, we're sort of slowing down things here. We're going to get ready for the next war in a few years. Oops. we go Because we go into, you know, Barbarossa and all of that. And so the historical production capacity of Germany is an unknown factor. However well we try to model it in the game, and I'm getting I'm getting to the point here is, and then of course with mods, black ice changes some of the basic parameters of production over the standard game, um, and then my mods and other mods. So I don't have a clue of what the historical ice, how many historical ICs you could be build to then. Um, and then you make the choice whether build more tanks or more aircraft, you know. And in, in this game, it obviously be tank units or aircraft units. But, you know, in, in you getting to make the choices on this. And his third question was, um, oh, should they make, and this is another point I want to address, should you make Japan hard, or, or no, China hard, you know, hard settings, so that Japan doesn't just steamroll them? And my answer is, again, people have this. If Japan AI, if, if China isn't artificially weak, excuse me, um, if China isn't artificially weak, Japan, the Japanese AI will get stuck into this war, will build more and more ground units, possibly um, evaporating all of its manpower, And then when you artificially or whatever declare war on America, you know, it's programmed to declare war on America and Britain, it won't have any for, and it will also um, pull off, and again, this goes back to sort of the home army, it will pull off every single division it can to fight that war in China out of Japan and out of any of these islands. This is why there is a um, technology here. I know I'm covering some of this stuff. I hope it's interesting here. Um, garrison deployment capacity. These, and you can see here, they all have artificially 1,000 weight. So basically, the AI can't move them off. And this is primarily, not entirely, primarily set up for Japan so that they get programmed. You know, it, orders of battles are created to give them garrison units that they can't move because otherwise they'll move them off because they won't feel too much of a threat. And they'll move these garrison units into actually fight on the front lines in China. And so they'll pull all this stuff off. So all sort of mobile divisions will be pulled out of Japan and they'll all be here. And then, oops, it's been declared war. Um, it's now declared war with a bunch of other people. And so you, 
two basic aspects. One, they will focus on a ground army and not build enough aircraft or submarines or ships or whatever. Now, yes, you can throw stuff into the production line, but that clogs up other things. That's sort of a bad way to program it. Where if it wins, so if you want Japan to be super weak, make China, have China historical. Now, that's the way it's supposed to be played if a human is playing as Japan. But this mod has designed to make China weak so that Japan wins. Yeah, it's unhistorical. But then gives, whether it's human, you know, humans playing as the allies, or if you're playing as Germany, to give the ally, the ally AI a bit of a, a fight in the East um, that is something it has to concern itself with instead of focusing purely on Germany. So that's sort of one of the unhistorical things that Black Ice does. I, I don't touch really. I mean, there's a few mostly Manchurian or Manchukuan events um, and deal relating with Germany and supplying of aircraft to uh, Manchukuo. But a few other things, not really war related, more propaganda related, dealing with Japan um, and Germany. So yeah, now what what is Ragar saying? Um, what about finding numbers of workers in tank factories and calculating assembly line efficiency? That you can show. Okay, um, but the records don't exist. German production generally maxed out mid forty four. And that was under the pressure of Allied bombings and shortages, but Hitler didn't want to do a full war economy until virtually too late. Absolutely the beam Sam. And see that yeah, that's see, and part of part of what we have here, and I know I'm talking about this, and this is part of the part of the reason I wanted to play this, partly to look at the game, but also to bring up these subjects is because like as I said, I'm a game designer. Now I'm just designing on top of somebody else's work. Other modders, the Black Ice team, not current in, in past generations, and of course on top of the Paradox people that made this game. I'm not starting from scratch, but I am designing on the game. I am tweaking and doing stuff. This isn't just flavor events to give you interesting factoids about World War II, which could be, but I do much more than that with Third Reich events. So I'm. It, this isn't justifying, it's more explaining what and why I'm doing things. Is Yes, you have some of these economic laws, full mobilization, war economy, later being able to go up to total mobilization, and you can see this is just generic big jumps, 10%, 25%. And so as Beam Slam is talking about, you have the... Um, now, we don't know how many people worked in a tank factory. How do we know that for Germany? We might have the records and be able to find it out in America, but we don't know what it is for Germany because so much of that records are just gone. They burned, they destroyed. Now what Germany did lots of that destruction, um, you know, at the end of the war of, of, of documents, but a lot just also got destroyed in the bombings and other things. Um, now I'm sure there are records surviving, but we as game designers, and I'm including Paradox, don't have access to those documentation. Not that, Somebody from Paradox can't, you know, get in a plane or take a ferry or whatever, go to Germany. But they're just, a, and not that they can't even get access to some of these archives, you know, whether it's IG Farben's archives or, oh, does Ford, Ford Motor Company, what about all their their archives? You know, they made, what is it, the Opal trucks or whatever. Um, yeah, Ford had major factories, and TRE covers them, in Germany that... To the best of my knowledge, they were never national. I mean, they were put under national control, absolutely, but they were still considered property of Ford Motor Company, and they were still being paid into a fund, you know, German, you know, um, Nazi Reichsmarks, which are worth nothing at the end of the war, but they were still being paid for the products coming out of the Ford Motor Company. If those records still exist, does, does Ford Motor Company want you to look through them? But maybe Mercedes-Benz has an open door policy to look at their wartime records and see how much slave labor and non-slave labor and how efficient and blah, blah, blah. Some of the records may exist, but even if we have access to it, who is doing the work? So even if literally, hello, Marcel, good to have you here. Um, so even if the records exist, 
And even if the records are generally accessible by researchers, and maybe not general members of the public, but some sort of researchers, and a game designer would be qualified as that, it's the time it takes to dig through all of those records and come out. Now, most of that is what is so what I take as accessible is either um, what I can find online or what I can easily put on my bookshelf. Like I bought some years ago, um, what is it? The last year of the German army. And it covers the last year of the German army and it's collapsed. Now I've not read it because I, I bought it. Well, this would be great for developing mod modding works for the collapse of Germany. Mostly I haven't focused on the collapse of Germany. It's not a big book, but it's a book and it covers it. So I could look up. Yes. Opal. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of records out there, but we don't generally have access. What we have access to are published works, basically, um, whether published online or published in books. And I have, I don't know that I have more books on World War II than the developers of, at Paradox for Hearts of Iron 4, because I don't know any of them to know do they have. I don't know. Do I have a thousand books on World War II? I mean, I have multiple hundreds of books on World War II. I don't know if I quite get to a thousand books, but you know, well more than 200 books on World War II I have on my shelves. Um, well more than that. I don't know. Yeah, I probably don't have over a thousand, but I quite honestly, I don't know how many books on World War II, but more, more than a hundred. Oh yeah. Volkswagen. Well, Volkswagen um, is, are the makers of the um, Kubelwagen um, during the war. That's basically all they do. They, they convert their their starting production, their peacetime starting production over to making the Kubelwagen. And so you have like um, Beam Slam talking about between bombing of factories, whether final assembly factories or like the Balbering, the Schweinfurt raids on the Balbering factories on a component production on bombing of steel you know steel mills and whatnot so 44 this is this convinced what convinced me and i i know it's a book of self-justification but i do believe there's a lot of facts and i learned a lot about the inner workings mechanism you know how how the workings of the higher levels of the national socialist regime through albert spears albert spears inside the third reich great book highly recommend it now i, I read it that back in high school so i don't remember it i still have it on my shelf i've I'm building my my mod i've looked two or three things up in it over the the time of building my mod so i mean i really haven't gone in so it's not so much the details of any particular thing but just sort of how the clicks work and sometimes shifting alliances within you know the hierarchy of the national socialist government who who had lots of influence who didn't have influence all of that type of stuff all sort of goes into it. But as, hey, John, how you doing? My day is going great. So seeing like 44 is sort of the peak production, and I agree that was about the peak production, total war economy. But theoretically, they could have started that in 19, 1938. It, because we see things sort of like that in the Soviet Union. Um, not that it would have. Yeah, excellent book. And it's a lot of self justification for Speer and uh, both, you know, for, of all kinds of stuff. And there's so it's it's a you know a um, an apologetica or however you want to say it for Speer. And so you got to take it. And I probably you know he probably overestimates his um, brilliance in the book or whatever. I don't know. But, but you still learn a lot about the National Socialist regime and learn a lot about the production. But, you know, there would have been societal upset to mobilize Germany in it, the complete total war, you know, that you're doing in 44 in, in 1938. But you could have gone two or three steps towards it more in 1938. And you definitely could have gone once, once that war with France starts, now you don't turn it on in you know in a day in a week in a month, but you could have started turning on in 1939 once you're at war with France, and so that by September of 1940 it is fully there, 
And if you're Hitler and you know you're going to go east, you keep it going, even though just justifying, hey, we're still at war with Britain, we're still at war with Britain, we're doing, you know, even though France is defeated, we're still doing, you know, the total war production capabilities. But you could get that turned on because there wouldn't be that much bombing. There wouldn't be that much, you know, whatever going on um, in 19, you know, 39 through through 40 as there was, you know, because it really, Speer really only comes into it really in 1942. And, and he's constantly struggling, constantly struggling. You know, um, we want to shut down this thing and this gal out here, but this gal lighter won't do it because, or, or, or convert it to something else or whatever. And manpower is being wasted and production is being wasted in this beer stein factory. Well, we need beer steins. No, we don't. You know, and he's constantly fighting all this stuff and these People come and complain to Hitler, and sometimes Hitler supports them, sometimes they don't, sometimes what, and he's constantly doing this, or and or his apparatus. Well, you know, you could have more state support for it, and still. So, we know there's all kinds of problems. So, this is why I look at it as being, um, thank you, John, is we don't know what the capacity of German production was. We can make guesses, and they can be um, highly informed guesses, well-educated guesses, but we don't know. So we can't do that. Now, if you come down to, you know, what was, you know, the tanks, either the tanks sent or the tanks delivered to, you know, North Africa at different stages, yeah, that's all doable. You know, so we can, we can you know, if you, you know, get, uh, you know, what, what units were used in the invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia, and yeah, that's, e that's fairly easy to war game. It's this grand strategy that gets hard. And this was one of the things I was thinking about, those who have been watching live stream earlier, I was playing the um, East Front campaign continuation. We were getting bombed out in some of these places. Now, this is all in Luft Zone West, or whatever it's called, and TRE, and there is a cost to it. It's not free. We can see some of the cost. TRE Pioneer Program is the basic 3% ICs down. Is that how much it should be? I don't know. That's just a wild ass guess on my part, wanting to make it costly for multiple years, because this, this, you know, it's not just, you know, it's it's going on. It'll go until about 1940 or something. Um, so 3% of ICs, it's just a guess. And, but there will be other events that will have costs like in steel and other elements for that pioneer program is what it was called to building the West Wall. Well, part of it is building a bunch of anti-aircraft cannons, you know, mostly 88 millimeters. And so a lot of these places with TRE, you don't get them free, like I just pointed out, but you get at a cost, you'll get this sort of this sort of zone with a bunch of it and i forget whether it's level one or level two aa but you'll get this you don't get this in you don't get it a quite blanket done with black ice so i'm trying to make good guesses i would if somebody wants to come at me with an informed opinion you know, oh, it should cost more, it should cost less. Um, they shouldn't put AA here, but put it, put AA in Bonn or whatever. I'm, I'm very happy to consider adjusting things, but um, I have Hitler in here. With that. Okay, um, what about Audi? During okay, Audi um, was part of Auto Union, which they were a major um, vehicle producer during the war. Uh, that that um, auto union um, basically ends up being, I think, um, post-war organized into Audi, but they were one of the companies in auto union, a union of automobile manufacturers. Basically, it was I think it was Ford Motor Company. I don't know if there was Chevrolet in Germany, maybe a German factory. Ford Motor Company, Mercedes, Auto Union. I'm talking for, you know, major truck production, cars or trucks. I think that was it. Now, eventually you got Tatra from Czechoslovakia that, that comes into play and some other stuff. 
but sorry i don't remember all of it but so yeah so i'm trying to build tre to give a realistic experience of world war ii and so that's sort of and i wanted to talk about partially setting this is just sort of set up to talk about this and what my mod is trying to do and it's sort of in the experience of the game where i wasn't able to take moscow in the first year which normally doesn't happen for me now the one of the big changes is this here all these spawn penalties where before the units would just i would just oh well let's um we want to move that up move that up to there um where before i would just sort of like what i'm doing here is constantly move the production down to the bottom of the the production queue to then eventually um, eventually get it into production once i got the ic's done we get the metal and now that's sort of historical now what is the plausible and this is the other big unknown is and they were and the it, it, the war doesn't come as a surprise the 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 war in 1930 in september 1939 with Britain and France comes as a bit of a surprise. Hitler gambles, and he knows it's a gamble, because he has the peace treaty with um, Soviets to keep the Soviets out of the war in Poland, you know, well, or to get them into the war, but on his side, taking their half of Poland as it, as it worries. And so he knows that yeah, Britain and France might actually, might honor their defense agreements with Poland. Yeah, they didn't with Czechoslovakia, but they might do it this time. You never know. So that comes as a surprise to Hitler. But the idea that the war is coming is not a surprise to Hitler or in the, in the top Nazis. The Horschbach Memorandum clearly states that. You know, it, the, the war is coming. They know it. Now, you have, if you want to play, and that's a cool way to try to play and so i can't answer whether tre gives you more or less or should you build ic's or shouldn't you build more ic's to get the historical level of production capability i'm sorry i can't give you a number i can't i don't know what it should be but i personally also believe that Germany could have expanded its ICs more than it did. So there's there's the historical amount of production, you know, fact capabilities. But we also know because like the um, Nieberlungen works, the, the tank factories, they build those during this period. So it's not like there's pre-existing tank factories and that's what they use. No, they're building new major production works that expand tank production. I just know tank production better than some of the other facets so i'm presuming this is going on on with building more aircraft factories submarine development factories what at what point how much more could they and i'm sure they could have expanded production capabilities that is a major thing now are am i as a player overly spamming this probably yeah i'll admit that this is partially a game um but i'm having to fight the game of the ai you know, and so, but definitely some of this was going on. What is the historical level? I'm not sure. How much more could they have made than the historical level? I'm not sure. This is one of the things I do sort of think is better in Hearts of Iron 4 in that you build both or you build multiple types of factories and only some of them can build other factories. And you can switch them back and forth. So, okay, more fuel supplies. So, yeah, um, I don't I don't think TRE makes the, the game too easy or whatever for his history-based, but I do think, I don't know. I don't know if it makes it, I don't know. I, I probably, if somebody did the math from all of the event given things, even with their costs in there, most of the time there's costs. Um, it'll probably be easier than standard black ice. Probably, but I'm not sure of that. Okay, most of these are fairly well done. And so that's my sort of explanation of what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do with TRE. 
And do remember with TRE that to start, I take away 10% of Germany's ICs. So until, the, until late in 36, you're actually at a 10% hit to your ICs. And that's partially because um, Schacht and others weren't trying to build a war machine. They were definitely, Schacht was definitely on board with the idea of strengthening Germany's armed forces, but he was also trying to strengthen, shall we say, the um, uh, civil economy as well. He's got a free finch. Um, what type of tanks was the... What type of tank was the Paula tank? A tiger? I don't know. Oh, you're talking about War Thunder, maybe? The... Um, will Thierry go one day... Uh, if not, that is fine. Well, I did make the mod for um, a partial production for Hearts of Iron 4. But two reasons. One, I want to get paid for my effort and work. And two, um, I don't have a strong enough interest just to make it as a mod for Hearts of Iron 4. It's one thing updating, it's one thing adding, you know, another 10 or 20 um, events to TRE for Hearts of Iron 3. So if I can ever work out, and I have contacted way back when, they were, their answer was not yet for the idea of TRE becoming some sort of DLC. Um, so if, if I can work out something with Hearts, with, with Paradox, yeah, if they want to, they, they got my information, if they want to go, um, Tomorrow, hey, we want TRE. Can you build it out for um, uh, Hearts of Iron Four? Yep, I'll get get right on that. I got it partially. I mean, and the the ver the version currently that I do have is not playable with all the updates. It it has to be massively reworked. So it's not like oh, release it. No, it got a lot of, a lot of work just to be able to release what's going on. So so I don't know if it'll ever come out as a as a, a mod. The main aim for a relative comparable production is to match the 39 production, then it can be scaled up at a quicker rate than historical choices possible. Yeah, I, I hear you, Beam Slam, and that, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay, Twin Engine Armament Research Advance, which allows Twin Engine Fighter Prototype. So we're going to stop that. And we're going to come down here and do Twin Engine Fighter Prototype. There are many, many hours go into building the mod. I love doing it, but still. Now, Thank you very much. Now, Beam Slam, if you ha come to the conclusion that I have come to the conclusion of that Germany will lose the war if they only produce the historical level up to 3940 and they don't really expand production pri prior to the war, they will lose the war. If the war unfold sort of like it does historically, meaning you declare war on Poland, the Western allies jump in on that war. And then if you uh, attack the Soviet Union prior to defeating Britain or the Soviet Union, because my understanding of it's, and I believe it, I know it was coded this way. Black Ice is coded that if you take London and you're not yet at war with um, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union comes into the war. So you're going to get a two front war if you take London, I believe, or or it's some collection of uh, provinces in um, in Britain. 
So you, I just just know that if you go after here, you should be getting a two front war with Black Ice, um, and you better be prepared for that. So you might, yeah. Um, so Germany is lost, and I'm not interested in well. You know, if the game works well, works right, and you know Germany's lost, what's the point of playing? We can hold out for an extra six months? Or what? So this is, um, yeah, that's what they did. And so if you just want to play the losing war over and over and over, I want to play the plausible what if scenarios not well what if martians came down or what if germany had 10 times the production and they found a unlimited oil supply sitting in the middle of their country um you know unreasonable things like that okay i'm not interested in pushing those kinds of ideas now, some people commented, you got a lot of oil. Well, I'm paying for this oil through building of supplies and trading them off. Um, what other now? 37 technologies that I want to do. Mm, well, okay, that will... Mm, Escorts. Okay, let's do Huffduff. High frequency direction finding. So I don't think it comes down to generalship. Why Germany wins or loses. I just don't think that's the answer. I just don't think Germany... Oh, wow, good. Let's pop up and pause these in the future. American blueprints stolen. Our spies have stolen plans that let us improve our abilities in carrier, light, anti aircraft artillery. Not that it's really going to benefit us, giving the following effects. We're probably not going to build many of those, but cool. Um, we're not doing more zinc mines at the moment. This game does not well simulate um, politics. Yes, sort of if you lose enough victory point hexes, that symbolizes a collapse of a country. Yeah, okay. That works. Um, and that's sort of that. There is the great what if, you know, if a few battles turned a little differently, um, moving into the Eastern Front, if you'd driven straight to Moscow, does that make a um, Soviet political collapse happen? Maybe, but that's just a maybe. Um, small caliber anything, Michigan. So if you don't have... <sighs> medium velocity, we want to research. So let's, let's just say... Um, take Moscow. You know, this game was designed. Take Moscow. Roll a d6. On a 1 or a 2, Soviet Union um, offers uh, surrender terms of some sort. You can choose to accept them or not. Now, you know, um, so there's, you know, a 30% a chance that if you take Moscow in the first, you know, within the first year, campaign season, whatever, not maybe eventually or maybe even eventually or maybe it's a 50 50 chance if it takes it you know in the first year of it of the attack you know the first campaign season um you know first six months or whatever it is um there's a 50 50 chance of the soviet union offering surrender terms now if you don't accept them they'll fight on but um maybe even a diminished capacity or something um, if you take moscow um and if you take Moscow at any time, there's a, you know, uh, 1d6 chance. Um, 
you know, 15% chance, basically, that the Soviet Union will surrender. But you roll the dice once just to sort of represent a possible political collapse uh, of the Soviet Union at that point. So without something like that, that could have happened, you know, what ifs in real life, I don't see the Barbarossa army because it's just too exhausted. Now, there's def without significantly changing things like production. And obviously, we see, and as Beam Slam was talking about, um, they only reluctantly and only after the really to my the best of my understanding and it's been years since i've read it so anybody can correct me if i'm wrong now in chat or later on the the, the situation is it's only with the winter of 1941 does hitler really see putting it into a true wartime economy they try with rationing they try to keep the peacetime economy going as much as they can because of lack of popular support for the war with France and Britain. They're trying to satisfy the domestic needs of the German people for, not necessarily like luxury goods, but just shoes instead of boots for soldiers, clothing instead of uniforms for soldiers, you know, whatever it might be. They're trying, they're really trying to do what they can to satisfy the civilian production market. And then once France is defeated, it's like, well, hey, most of the war is over, so they actually cut back, like I've said already, cut back on military production and continue civilian production. Now, Hitler knows, and some of the very top Nazis know, that just because you have some guy, some generals war room planning out a Barbarossa campaign doesn't mean that it's ever going to be implemented, because they're planning it out for now, and then in six months or a year, some other group of generals will come in and plan out another one and plan out another one, and for the one day, eventually, we may go to war with the Soviet Union, but that could be two or three years down the road from what even the top generals are doing, and sure... You go, well, the German army should just know because they're putting all the troops on the the Soviet border. Don't know if you're hearing the trash truck or whatever's outside. Saturday should be a trash truck. I don't know what it is. Some something. Um can't quite see from my window, but it's just down the block. The mere fact that the great bulk of the German army is and I'm not talking like the the thirty days prior to it. I'm talking, you know, months leading up to it um it's just the biggest threat you know because hell britain isn't you know might be doing raids and they've got lots of divisions sitting along you know spread out along the coast dealing with british commando raids but britain isn't going to be launching a major raid italy's an ally you know who's going to be attacking the soviet union so it's it's not even apparent to the best of my knowledge to you know relatively high-ranking generals that we're going we're it's already been decided that we're going in now technically it'd be called off but um you know like i guess had um america jumped into the war hitler might you know early enough hitler might have called off the barbarossa going oh shit now britain has a real real ally we've got to be prepared to fight them so so long as you're going, you, they don't, they can't quite tell everybody that they're going to war with the Soviet Union. So Hitler keeps a lot of civil production going and limiting military production. And this is 1941, 1940, 1941. And it isn't until the winter disaster, the, the pushback from um, Moscow, a significant loss of life. I don't want to minimize the loss of life. But the for the German soldiers, but even a greater loss in equipment and supplies, because so much of it just has to be abandoned, maybe destroyed, but abandoned, you know, um, but left there and retreated because the Germans had the soldiers had to fall back against the the Soviet counteroffensive, and it's only in response to that. Does Hitler um, make Tote armaments minister and really give him the assignment of get production up and going vigorously? And then he dies in the airplane crash. 
and Speer is put in charge as his replacement. And for the greater world, Speer is almost a nobody, including German production. He, you know, he's well known by Hitler, and he is shown to be a reasonably good organizer of the limited amount of construction activities that he's done, mostly in, well, the Brown House is sort of the early one, but mostly in and around major buildings in Berlin, like the um, Reich Air Ministry, the, um, the Reich Chancery, and whatever. Those are Speer's projects. Yeah, he's using organization tote um, workers, and he's using... Um, uh, NSKK driver units, you know, driving trucks, moving supplies, but he's organizing those up. It's Tote who, who gets it first because he's, you know, starts out really is organizing up and managing the building of the Autobahn and then later the West Wall and then starting some of the projects on the, um, some of the early West Wall or, um, the Atlantic Wall stuff, even before it's really the Atlantic Wall. So, um, you know, it's only those that it's, and that's too late, is sort of the point. You know, that's, at earliest, I would say, would be winter 41, do they really start? Because Hitler is just convinced that you, you, you kick the door in, the House of Cards, the Soviet Union is going to fall down. And his panzers are, you know, his army is advancing well enough that it appears to him. So he's not worried about production. And so that's too late. So if I can't ramp up production in my mind prior, you know, and 36 is a good year in my mind to start that because that's when you're starting to get conscription in Germany, you're, you're occupying, militarizing the rest of the, the Rhineland, though you've already got, you've, you've already in 35, only in 35, have you gotten full control back, not militarized, but full control back to the Saarland here. So up until 35, France is still basically administering this and to some some degree sucking off um, uh, resources from the Saar land. So that, and that's just in 35. So you really, it's, it's 36 is the key year. And so that's why to some degree, to some degree, whatever I do, and yes, this is a bit spammy, a bit overdone, you know, we're just building factories. I'll admit that. But at least half of this should be being done if we're talking even real history capabilities starting in 36 is starting to push this out in 36 starting to really ramp up production capabilities to increase production take it out of manpower for the army the ones that get killed kz prisoners which is not very effective true king murray you're among your books do you have forgotten soldier by i don't think so so I, you know, a lot of the books I bought and read, you know, bought a book, read it, bought a book, read it, bought a book, read it. Um, but periodically I've come across um, secondhand sales and very cheaply. Oh, you've got 20 books on World War II and they're 50 cents a piece. Yeah, I'll take them. At least all the ones I don't recognize that I have in my collection. So I, you know, so I've collected a bunch of stuff that I haven't read. But so I don't know that I haven't read that book. I can, I can tell you that, David. Mobilize women. Oh, the, the Nazis mobilize women too for production. Oh, yes. The Nazis prior to the war are trying to get women into the household and out of the at least industrial workforce and in a limited capacity. Now, the Nazis always recognize the outstanding woman, okay? They are not against the idea of the outstanding woman. And I, I just coined that term right now. I don't know if any of they've ever used it. And I'm thinking of like Hannah Reich, um, you know, the, the pilot, the test pilot. And then we have Ellie Beinhorn, who was more of a long distance, less of a test pilot. Um, pilot. And you, you have, oh, I forget the, the one woman in charge of the, the Nazi women organization. And a few other, they're always willing for the, um, always willing for the idea of the outstanding woman in society that will break the norms 
and they can pal around with Hitler and be part of the elites and be shown off to be that. So they're not down on women at all. In fact, they, they highly praise women in the Nazi ideology stuff. Um, and they're not against women operating in the workforce, even in the civilian economy. But they see it as um, the prime. Well, okay, I'm, I'm sort of changing what I'm saying as I'm thinking about this. They see the primary or the best use for women in society is in the home raising children. And they may be right about that. The best use. Not, not the only use that they should have, have, but that's sort of the best. I think women raising children, I, my mother was, uh, I mean, my mother did not work outside of the home. Um, she did do, she was an artist, she was a calligrapher, she, in the olden days, um, because photos weren't, didn't necessarily print up very well for flyers, for, ha for real estate houses, because um, I remember as a kid sitting in the car, she would go, and I'd sit there with her, um, she would go and sit in front of somebody's house and draw that do a you know a line ink well do it in sort of pencil or whatever and then um do a drawing of the house for the for you know the real estate for real estate brochure because they would you know put flyers out you know pass them around the neighborhood do whatever this is before the web obviously and so just uh, some photos well one wouldn't print up necessarily well but even then he, he, your imagination can do better with doing because you're sort of removing the neighbors' houses. You're you're sort of idealizing the house. It's still accurate, but you're you're sort of cleaning things up a little bit, making it look a little better with a line. And she would do that. And it'd take her hours to sit there, and I would you know sit in the back of the car and read or whatever. And this is when I was pretty young. Um, once I was older, I was allowed to stay at home. But so she'd go do that, and she'd and then spend hours at home in a drawing board, you know, inking it out. And she, she also did calligraphy projects. She she had some level of income, but most of the income was provided by my dad and his work. So you know, single that's probably the best solution. I think I think the feminists have lied to us that all women should be in the workforce. Now that doesn't mean. Women shouldn't be in the workforce. That doesn't mean women shouldn't have the opportunity and be welcome in the workforce. I just sort of agree that probably the best use is women raising the families at home. Best use. And I would say that that is sort of what is going on in the West as well at this time. Now, once the war starts up, it doesn't take, well, and even before the war starts up, you know, there, there are women in light industry. Um, they probably don't get into heavy industry, you know, steel production or something, or coal mining, really at all in Germany. And women are definitely, you know, working r rurally, you know, on the farm, doing farm labor. But those are rural women. But very early on, the BDM, you know, the 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 older girls and that are are like they are in in Britain and other places, shipped out to farms to do basic farm labor. They are, um, oh, it was, I think, during World War I, um, I think it was Mauser first, during World War I, first puts women into rifle production, you know, on the rifle production lines, not as a secretary or, or a filing clerk or whatever in the factories, but actually, you know, in armaments production. Um, for Mauser in World War One, and this continue this happens again in World War Two. It's just not talked about as much, and it's definitely not the the ideological best use for a woman. But there's and I've been collecting recently a bunch of photos, um, you know, just on you know digital stuff online of a bunch of um, helferin or you know help women helpers for the Kriegsmarine. And they, they weren't on battleships, but they were, you know, helping with the, you know, port duties of whatever. So there's a fair amount of women working. And now they get mobilized. Not as dramatically as Britain, but I would say more dramatically than America, ultimately. Uh, America, there's a lot more propaganda about women workers, I think, than German propaganda about it. Okay, Gross Deutschland division is good, yes. Um, recommended reading a uh, list of commandant of the United States. Okay, very good, David. That may be, there may be truth in that when the children is young, but in wartime, passive work. Oh, well, see, now, yeah, I'm talking just 
Well, okay. Yeah, see, this is... There's the Nazi ideology, and then there's wartime realities. Nazi ideology does not want central planning for anything. Hitler is against central planning. Fascism likes central planning. They want to know that every year you need, let's say, one million shoes made for your country. So they want to make one million shoes in a variety of sizes. Hitler wants the competition between shoe manufacturers. He does not want a single organizers of shoe production in Nazi ideology. That there's a, this is where, and I, the more I've looked into it, including watching the stuff from TIK, and the more I've looked into it, I was taken in originally that Nazism is just fascism plus racism. No. They're both totalitarian systems. They're both bad. That being said, Nazism, National Socialism, is different than fascism. Both fascism and National Socialism are a type of socialism, but they are not, I will agree with this, they are not Marxist leveling socialism, meaning they're not trying to make everyone equal in societies. They're, but they're both corporate, they're cor, they're corporate, and I don't mean corporate like as in corporate, you know, business corporations, but they're both corporate, corporate type ideologies for there are collectivist ideologies. They are both willing, both fascism and Nazism are both willing to have hierarchical um, org organizations, um, hierarchical incomes. But so long as all of the people in society are well taken care of. The Nazis, very early on for the right type of people, not Jews, not communists or other peoples, for the right type of people, they, they work very hard in public housing. They clear out the, the ghettos that have always existed in places like Berlin. And some of the buildings are still standing, but they, they, they clear them out. The buildings are still there, but they go from six or eight people occupancy in, in a room or, or a couple of rooms down to you know one or two. They clear, they clear it out, they clean it up, they put plumbing in there, and they build new housing for, for lower income or unemployed people of the right types. So the Nazis are socialist in that aspect, but the Nazis always want to maintain a competitive market for things. They don't want capitalism but they want that sort of competing shoe manufacturer kind of thing. I'm using that just as an example. They don't want to have it centrally planned, or they don't want to have one shoe manufacturer megacorp for Germany. That may be for fascist Italy. That's and then um, not private. Or we're not you know hierarchically owned, meaning someone can have more stock than somebody else in it. You know, Soviet Union purely government owned shoe manufacturer factory or corporation or however you want to organize, call it in the Soviet Union, they want to see a competing things. Now, because of, because of the war, Speer is trying to get rid of that. Not that Speer disagrees with that. He wants all boot manufacturers to be organized because all shoe manufacturers become boot manufacturers in essence, or they're making, you know, the leather cartridge belts or the leather, you know, belts or, or other sort of leather goods that soldiers wear you know, the helmet liners, whatever. Um, so all shoe manufacturers, and it takes time for, you know, I've been talking about this, takes time for Speer to get in control of this, but he is trying to organize it and centrally plan boot production. So you don't have competi competing, you may have different factories making boots, but you're not trying to like, they're not trying to bid each other down or up or whatever. You know, I'll make boots cheaper than that company or I'll make, you know. No, he's trying to get it all organized up. So the reality, Nazi ideology versus the realities of the war. So on the women's situation, it's the realities of the war change, not their ideology, but change the immediate use of women in the workforce. So that is how I would argue the difference is so you you have to look at try to look and understand the ideology and then look uh, look at the sort of practical how it was implemented hope that's understandable to everybody and not short barreled too far in advance for right now and artillery unit command and control okay
We're at 37, I know, but we're going to come to that, get that going. Mm, let's just get armor up there, and we'll get back to... Yes. You, they built the... Um, um, for 1936, the Winter um, Olympic Sports Facilities. <clears throat> for a few years, including into the war, they continue to hold winter sports um, competitions there. So, I don't... Garminch Park Tent Konkurkutschutzen. Yes, okay. Simple German spelling. <clears throat> One of Speer's projects prior to him, you know, as architect for Hitler, is build the Paris Exposition you know, Pavilion for, and there's the model of it. Speer's touching it. Hitler's looking on. How big do we want to do it or not? Yes, we will pay for that. Again, you can decide not to do this or do this. You might get a bonus if you do it. Okay, we're going to reorganize the war industry and expand our heavy industry. Sarbuchen, good. We already should be having... Maxing that out, more heavy industry. Um, the two traits fascism and national socialism have in common are socialism and totalitarianism, absolutely. Everything else, central planning, religion, organization of society, view of the world, are different, if not opposite to some. Absolutely, Van Bishop. I agree with that statement. That statement is completely accurate. Yes, that is that is my current understanding of uh, both fascism and national socialism and how they are similar and or different. And yeah, I'm um I am not saying um just be, because they're different they shouldn't be defeated. Now I will say and this is going to be gamer saying something controversial here. In limited circumstances, for limited time, for a um, country either going under great stress or going under great stress, which can be moving from a um, human or animal labor agrarian society moving into some level of industrial society. Maybe just industrial farming, you know, buying tractors from foreign sources and putting them into your, you know, use your your use. A fascistic, including the elements of taking care of the poor and the needy, because you may have a large population that are, um, you know, I'm thinking of things like Spain um, during this time period, where you have a large population of workers who use hand tools to farm fields that you're putting them out of work by putting machinery in there and you don't have immediately ready industrial or other jobs to go and instead of capitalism and where well they just get to starve or something you go you have a plan so you have a fascistic trying without being fascism of total control or um, totalitarianism you know, mostly he never gets total control of, you know, there's always a king above him. He never implements totalitarianism in um, Italy. He is definitely implements authoritarianism. But if you're going through a situation like that and you're going through a massive societal change, not where you see like in Britain or like in Germany where that is over many years the industrialization happened. I'm thinking often like in the third world. In a modern sense, yeah, a fascistic type thing, but not as a goal, not as a um, objective, good way of being. It's more like, oh, hey, we have all these people. They they raise goats. Well, we're going to destroy the goat economy because we're going to be bringing in food from. And so you 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 build a planned economy for a short time. Now the the hard part is is getting away from that. Hello. Das Kyugio fan? Uh, I'm sorry, but that's. We're talking about World War II and societies and cultures. So, some fascistic elements can be useful, but I am not a fascist. I am a sort of market economist, and I want, I want, I don't want monopolies. So, People that criticize capitalism, well, some, yeah, if you let companies, monopolies or even duopolies, two companies controlling things, um, 
is a bad element. So you can, if you let capitalism, if you, if, if the government situation doesn't keep competition going in markets, whatever, whether it's the markets, any particular market, if it becomes controlled by any one industry or two industries, you know, companies, whatever, that is a, that is a problem. So you have to, ha I'm not a purist on anything, but I am a, a market capitalist as the best. Just desky. Okay. That's easier to say. Single engine airframe research. So yeah, um, I do have that controversial opinion that there is a usefulness. Now I have no usefulness for racism. I, was it? you know and camps and putting people into them and all the totalitarianism that comes along with a lot of this stuff i think it's bad i think it's bad 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 you don't get any sort of support f for me with any of that so yeah where communism definitely has the impulse, whether it's carried out well or not, to try to take care of the common man or woman or whatever, but we call it the common man in English, um, in times of stress, like I was talking about, feeding the poor, feeding the hungry. Now, of course, you know, it has the impulse, but um, we can see the Holodomor where they try to starve out the Ukrainians. Um, so in actuality, it's, it's a bit different. But we see that, but there, the problem, the evils of that, at its core, it's fundamental, even in basic practice, is not, it is the idea of uh, that equality and outcome is a good thing and that the state is going to attempt to achieve it by taking away um, stuff, money, food, whatever, from those who, who also, you know, have, have it. And it's, that is what is evil. It's the leveling. And I sort of use the term from the um, 17th century in Britain, levelers. They were the group of people. They didn't want it. They wanted everybody equal. Now, they, they, they weren't communists as far as, well, they, some might have been communists. So it wasn't, but it really wasn't like everyone was going to comment the general leveling um, philosophy. It wasn't like everyone was going to in common hold all the land or hold all the means of production. It was, oh, well, everyone's going to have the same size of farm. And there were going to be no lords. And everyone's going to have the same size of shoe shop because they weren't, you know, they manufactured, they didn't have large factories generally back then. You know, so it was all going to be equal, but sort of equally owned. And then, you know, competing with it. They, they did not want to have a hierarchical outcomes. So the leveling aspect, ideo ideology often ends. Pragmatism is dull, but much. Well, and as you can sort of tell is like I was talking about sort of in a pragmatic solution for, you know, because we can look at what do you do if there is, okay, let's just say that, because I, you may remember the, you know, the videos and coming out of Fukushima in Japan with the tidal wave coming in from the earthquake. What if you had a much larger event for a country like Japan that, yeah, let's say 40% of the people survived, you know, from some massive disaster. You think market economics is the best way to deal with the, the disaster and get Japan back on its feet? No, that isn't. You have to have a centrally organized system to, if you will, stem the bleeding. You know, get, get aid where, you know, food aid. You know, I'm not just talking emergency medical aid. I'm talking about general food aid into, you know, and sustainable for a while. Um, food aid into it and how to set up s systems to distribute it I'm presuming you know, importing food into Japan or someplace like that for a while that they're not feeding themselves and and so by doing that you wreck the farming market you realize whenever we send large groups of aid to Africa or to Haiti or whatever else yes we're feeding starving people and that is a good thing but we're also destroying at the same time the local um, food a production economy. All those guys go out of work in essence because no one wants to buy their food because they get free food from the aid companies. And so now they're, they're without 
And, and we're not talking about rich guys. We're talking guys with hand tools out there that are farming normally, you know, um, that they make themselves. We're not talking about big industrial things. So we, when you come in with big aid, you know, like big pharma, big aid, you destroy things. Now, maybe the big aid is better. The destruction it does is better than the other destruction. I'm not saying it isn't. But you have to be aware of that. And then you have to design your aid not to disappear from one day to the next, but to taper down so that the local economy, local food growth production economy can at least get back into some sort of shape. And so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about um, is where some of what the Italians were saying, and I'm, I'm very afraid because somebody's either going to clip this someday or try to try to attack me in a, in a bad way. Um, some of those elements in a temporary state in an emergency are useful, but I am not ideologically agreeing that they are the goal like they were thinking of it. That is a very different thing. Okay, small fuel tank research. And it's grayed out. And aero engine research advance, and it is grayed out. Very good. Okay, so we're in 1937. We're doing most of the 1937 text that I want to do here. Let's look over here for more. I don't know, four engine, four engine plane gun. Okay, we can do twin engine 1935. We have, that's it, free. Hello, the real Garan. How you doing? Well, yeah, this is with this is this is specifically um, Black Ice with Third Reich events, and this is a black uh, a Third Reich event um, event. And so, what I'm doing here, just to explain this, is it has a cost of supplies. That's part of the idea. Instead, especially early on and still to this day, I sort of like to cost some of the stuff in supplies as opposed to reducing ICs. And now that I find out that fuel production is based upon available ICs, makes me want to do that even more. So for the cost, and you can't, unless you're going to cheat, you, you know, by auto firing this over and over this, this is a limited amount. So it's probably cheaper. Again, and also I don't believe reality is a zero sum game in that we only have a certain amount of ICs that can produce other ICs. I believe economies and production is a bit more fluid. The, the pie is, it isn't a fixed set of pie. The pie can grow and shrink. There are other dynamic elements that are put into this beyond um, uh, pure gameplay mechanics, if you will. But I don't think you should be able to spam, that, spam out in Leipzig huge amounts and this is at a discount this isn't free and there are there was other payments prior to this because part of an event chain but this is the luna verk was a large plant which produced synthetic gasoline through coal liquefica liquefaction it used lignite it's a type of coal as the raw material should we build the hydrate hydrator work there's lignite and there's there's two different two different forms that i'm forgetting right now probably in the mod somewhere, um, the other type of um, liquefaction of the other type of coal. Um, so we will get rares extraction, we will get modified oil rig, and rares, because the rare, rares represents um, synthetic rubber, which is also being made at the same time, and we'll lose two energy in Leipzig, where Leipzig is what, here? Yes, so um, we have lots of light, lots of coal, and so this is this is reducing a little bit of coal um, out of the base here, and um, so that's no longer making coal; it's making oil. So yes, we will go with the thing that I look as a minimum amount of historical setup in here. Let's see, um, labor rights, pension funds, forms of free public health care were introduced the first time in Italy by fascism. Let's not forget fascism has rural roots, landowners as opposed to industrial roots, tycoons, or military roots. There's all, this also explains why the army um, tied to the crown and the navy never fully supported neither Mussolini as an ex-socialist nor the war. Yes, very true, Van Bishop. Very true. I agree entirely with that. 
Well, very good. I think Black Ice, especially with all of the, the mods, including my mod, um, is the best Hearts of Iron for or Hearts of Iron game made. For I've not played one or two, but I played three and four extensively. And so it does add quite a lot to the game. Including a historically based I did all the research I could possibly do. And I'll say this again. We talked earlier, and some of you are still around from earlier, you know, about production levels. You know, find out um, how many workers were in factories and their efficiency, you know, factory workers to try to figure out IC levels. Right? Okay, and I talked about why we don't have access to it. There, to the best of my knowledge, there is not a published source. And I looked... And I bought books. I bought books. I didn't just like go look in my local library. I bought books. There is not an order of battle, if you will, published source for the SA in any book I could find um, after 1934. You got stuff before 1934, nothing after 1934 published. How did I come up with and these, these are the correctly named SA Brigades. How did I come up with SA Brigade? And it's called Brigades, but these are like Stimbands um, or whatever the, the appropriate. This six SA Marine unit here in Dortmund. And, yeah, that's a Marine, and yes, there was a Marine SA unit because it was sort of based along the river here. Um, there was an SA Marine unit here in Dortmund. Um, we the size is just generic and we don't have that okay how did I come up with this somebody published or um, an actual you know photographs they published you know images of a phone book this all comes from a, an SA phone book meaning they had the phone numbers for this SA brigade in Dortmund <laughs> So I know there's the six, the phone number for the SA Brigade in Dortmund was, and it's in the phone book. So that is how I've come up with, and I had to modify some things to fit in the the format of the, the I think it was the Obergruppe. I think it was that was already gone by this time. Um, but I didn't want to go straight to cores. Um, I think the Obergruppe was 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 already moved by removed by 1936. So that that's a little bit of retcon, a little bit of I mean they 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 existed earlier like in 34 35, but with some of the shrinking they got rid of that. I believe it was that. So did you call the F say who can you know, well it was the old obviously the old system. I don't think it would work. But that is that is how I found out where these were located and what sort of region and then the, but they also had the regional essay um like thuringian um higher up so i knew to to attach these units and the, uh, and it was sort of subdivided so um i knew that this this essay um group here which did ex they, i think it was the group that were gone the ober group the 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 ober group were gone the group were still there but had these subunits in it in the phone book it was sort of sub subsections of it and so that's why these look the way these you know okay where's his you know why is he attached to here and not to here well it's you know um this part the subgroup here so i went in and found that so that is how i did this order of battle that is the only way somebody you know and this was on axis um you know the axis military history um, forum um website that I found this that they had a um, somebody had photo photographed and then you know made the or photocopied or whatever um, the um, sometime in the 30s um, the phone book for the SA brigades and whatnot and so that's how I came up with this order of battle and that's the best thing I can find so if I no we're doing two things doing two things toy jet this is this is tre black ice combo that's just black ice okay improve security units so we're doing both uh is that improve security units yes yes and that and small warship armament designed 
Um, okay, grayed out. We'll do depth charges. I still need to test this, and I also wanted to talk about some stuff earlier on. I'm going to have to be ending here pretty soon because my throat is about ready to give out. Yeah, I'm mentioning that probably we should end. I want to thank you all for getting this far. I want to thank Toy Jet. I want to thank Chief. Um, the Hoffmanator, at least earlier on. Um, Yog Dog and others for support on Patreon. It goes to support both the um, YouTube channel work as well as the modding work. So if you want to, you can um, support me on Patreon. Links on the YouTube channel. Uh, maybe even put it well, below here the video. But hey, what I'm really asking for you is to like the video, comment on the video, even just saying hi really helps out. Um, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. I will be continuing more Hearts of Iron soon.